Hello, 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 my protagonist. I am Darkborn, your conquerable character, here on Doki Doki Donut on Darkborn Plus. Welcome, bienvenidos, to a very, very special story time with Darkborn, where I am going to be reading 13 Secret Cities by Cesar Torres, who is actually in the chat with us today. So, everyone say hello. Oh, by the way, if you're seeing little pop-up bubbles all over the screen, that's a new thing we're trying out. Uh, but yeah, so go ahead. I mean, go ahead and spam little emotes and whatever. Go ahead. And let's have fun. Have fun with it for a little bit. Let's let's see this. See, look, there, there you go. Right, look, look at that. Right there. Right there, too. <laughs> all right. Now, this is all thanks to all of you raising 30,000 sprunks. And for those who don't know what sprunks are, those are what we call our channel points, which are like giant, massive round sprinkles. And also, yes, by the way, Cesar Torres is LED Queens, so. <laughs> What's really cool is that LED is going to be, uh, or Cesar, is going to be in the chat, and when we have questions or anything, uh, he is willing to do a Q&A with us, so, uh, so just pay attention in chat, okay? And by the way, Cesar, I am so sorry if I butcher some of the, um, some of the names of, I think they're Az Azteca? The, the, the names, like, I've been having a rough time pronouncing Tezcatlipoca. Uh, and, well, now I'm saying it right, but earlier, uh, my moderator and Blizz can attest that I was, like, <laughs> struggling quite a bit with, with saying the word. And saying that name, and... But like I said, I am I am super excited to read this book to you all. So why don't we go ahead and go into our very cozy little corner and uh, let's go ahead, my protagonist, and let's go read 13 Secret Cities. And I almost hit the wrong button. Let's go to our little reading little nook. And there we are. <laughs> Uh, the the names are Nah Nahuatl Nahuatl. Uh, you just nailed it. This book. Uh, oh, so it's Nahuatl. Nahuatl. Na oh, they're Nahuatl. That's the language. Okay, got it. Nahuatl. Okay. Awesome. 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 All right. So first of all, like, okay. So I <laughs> I hope it is okay that I put the marigolds and meat the the meat clan in the backdrop of the book i hope that is okay i don't want to be disrespectful i just thought it would be like you know with because you know you know the other los muertos is, is is coming up on november 1st and 2nd so i figured let's uh just preemptively you know set the mood Give me just a moment. I need to shut my echo. Well, apparently she was listening in and thought I was talking to her. So. <laughs> okay. Miklan Tilt. Deku, Deku, uh, Miklan. I'm, I like. I was just going Miklan because I was like the, and the Mergos are also on point. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, all right. So let's 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 get going. All right. I hope that that um, our friends on your serve on 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 uh, Elite Queens are able to make it. Roku, Roku. Oh, okay. Mik Miklan Deku. Ko te kutli. Oh, mikta mik mik tlan te kutli. Mik tlan te kutli. Oh my gosh. 
All right, what was that? What was that? Oh, thank you for the host, Roku. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, so here we go. You're actually right on time, Roku. Victory will oh, thank you for the host, LED. All right, so here we go, everyone. We are going to go ahead. Uh, me. Okay. All right, so here we go. We're going to start. We're going to go. We're going to go ahead and start off with 13 Secret Cities, Part 1. Red is Katlipoka. Burn, writes my father taught me. There are 13 secret cities, but no one knows where they are. Archangel, Plainsong, The Violet Album, 2008, Reckless Records. The city of Chicago is experiencing a renaissance that outpaces all other North American cities. There has never been a place better, a better place to live. Acceptance speech by Mayor Ron Amadeo, Inauguration Night, 2010. The elders of the Ilini and Chippewa tribes explained that their people drew their strength from the immense lake they call Michigami. This body of water was the source of much fear and superstitious rumor. In their native tongue, they told me how death hovered above the waters like a cloud. The lake itself was a place of death, and its scent was that of carrion, when, where men tread, death stalked in shadows, make of no, made of no discernible form. Louis Joliet, Letter to Therese Chirac, 1674, Chicago History Museum Archives. A glance into the past revealed to me the simplicity of time. The moments of my life were stars suspended in the vastness of space, and each one shone bright. But between each one there is also a vast darkness, a vacuum that threatened to swallow their light forever. My story began with a single point, a single star. The events that happened on October 4th, 2013, in Millennium Park. I followed the cross-hatched dome of the pavilion. Moving toward the silver wings that cradled the stage, I shoved my way forward, scared to be knocked over by someone bigger than me. A hiss and a whistle overhead tore through the din of the shouts. I looked up to follow the noise above me. I turned my head toward the sky. Small objects streamed through the air headed north in the same direction I was moving. The missiles left white trails as they soared. When they reached the stage, I heard the metal clink like empty beer cans. A white cloud bloomed immediately in three spots. Those of us who could see the stage saw the tear gas swell before us. Our screams grew into shrieks. The protesters who had already gathered by the stage ran immediately away from the cloud. But they weren't quick enough. The white smoke swallowed them up. The hiss continued, and the cloud grew. The breeze blew toward the north, but Chicago wind was fickle, and it could turn right around toward the south at any moment. I thought about my parents and my brother, and it occurred to me that right now my father was probably still at work at the botanical gardens. My mother was also at her office, and perhaps she was texting my brother as he arrived home from school, just to make sure he made himself a snack while he waited for her and my father to come home. This thought shifted and moved beyond my grasp as I ran until it was gone. My shoulders, I, on my shoulders I wore the shawl my mother had given me the day I moved away to college and I wrapped it around my mouth and nose to keep the gas out. I fished in my pocket for a petrified moss, a good luck charm from my father that I carried on my keychain. I pivoted and ran toward the south, away from the stage. As I ran, I witnessed moments from my short teen, 19-year-old life flashed before me like water rushing down the side of a mountain. I relived the awkward pomp of the First Communion. 
the climbs we made on the mountain surrounding my grandmother's lopsided house in San Miguel, in San Miguel, Mexico, and the roads tripped through San Diego, and the road trips through San Diego when I was a toddler. I lived through those. I lived through the through these moments fast. In what? In was the girl with the long face and the auburn eyes, a face I could see with precision, as if I were a cameraman shooting these memories, these visions of a past slid down, slid downward, vanishing as soon as it had arrived, gone in microseconds, and I ran, my legs pumped with fury and speed, but they were untrained and clumsy. I was not an athlete, and I had not been and I have never been fit. And now the pounds of weight in the backpack on my back forced me to run without grace or agility. Now that tear gas was encroaching on the pavilion, slipping out of the straps would cost me precious seconds. About 200 feet in the distance, un uninformed police were close. Oh, uniform, sorry. I so excuse me about that. About 200 feet in the distance, uniformed police were closing this perimeter, shouting and pummeling and bellowing through megaphones. I would never make it past them without being beaten down by their weapons and their strength. I let my running stride slow down a bit, enough to shake off my backpack and to give me some time to think of where else I could run to. If I broke out toward the lake, to the east, I might be able to squeeze onto Columbus Drive and perhaps avoid the dozens of officers around us. My father had always warned us to avoid the lake. Instead, I ran straight toward it. I found the short concrete wall that lined the perimeter of the pavilion, just about forty feet ahead. I zigzagged my way over to it. My long legs, which I had always been proud of, catapulted me over the short wall of the perimeter. But my legs were too long, in fact. My shoe caught the edge of the concrete wall. I flipped forward and landed hard on my hands and knees. Awful long legs, I thought. But I looked around me. I could see the southern end of the pavilion and behind it. The glint of the BP bridge. I wrapped the shawl around my head one more time, through the gas, though the gas was starting to creep on into my eyes and sear them, sear them with pain. Other protesters were escaping through this very same route, where the police and SWAT forces were a little thinner. I realized I was free. I was escaping the pavilion. Just as I came to standing, I heard the crack of gunshots behind me. One, then another, and another. I heard new voices, full of anger, surging through the crowd. New gunfire exploded, and this time it sounded very different from the first three pops I heard. Their rhythm was calculated and precise. Perhaps it is an automatic weapon. The bursts grew loud and moved closer to where I stood. Whoever was firing was cutting through the middle of the pavilion, I kept on running away from Pritzker, and I spotted an opening about 30 feet with few officers where I could run through. I turned around one more time to look behind me, though the open patches of clear air inside the white cloud. The SWAT team, uh, the SWAT officers had now joined the police. They wore gas masks lowered over their face, and their Kevlar gear protected them like a scarab shells. They formed a dark ring around this cloudy oval, and they moved in tight, choking it out. They fired over and over. Their dark figures and hard helmets rendered them genderless, ageless, raceless. Soon, the thick gas engulfed the black shapes of the SWAT men, too. The whole pavilion disappeared under the chemical mist. The screams were beginning to fade a bit, and I realized that the gas might be taking its effect now, silencing the crowd as it burned itself into their eyes and throats. 
more gunfire explode from the white cloud. In front of me, I could see the street and the snaking structure of the, deep, of the BP bridge. Hundreds of people ran in every direction, pleading for help that wasn't going to come. Though police officers flanked, uh, though police officers flanked the entrance to the bridge to seal off the area, I spotted an op opening that I could take. I darted through. I ran up the curving path of the bridge. By now, I had stopped paying attention to the discomfort in my legs and the ache in my throat. I'd become a runner. I didn't dare to look behind me, though I could hear the cacophony still. The run, over, the run over the bridge became a kaleidoscope of fear, my ragged breath, the pointed spikes of sailboats in the marina, and the silvery reflections of the waters of Lake Michigan, where I was headed. Then I moved towards the exit, relieved. I dashed toward Lakeshore Drive, and I clutched the fossilized moths in my hand. I felt like a coward. I didn't know how to stay back there in the pavilion and fight, but how could I? Someone was shooting guns in there, and all I wanted to and all I wanted was to run away f run far away from that from this place. And Edgar, I had no idea what happened to him. I had a cell phone in my pocket, but my mind could not conceive picking it up and using it. Instead, my legs did the thinking for me, telling me to go far away from this place. Before me lay Lakeshore Drive. If I reached its underpass, perhaps I could catch my breath for a few moments and then continue to toward the lake. If hiding meant I had to jump into its icy waters, I was ready to do it. I felt a sigh of relief when I ran down the grassy slope that led to the overpass. I was almost there. The flapping beats of helicopters overhead smothered my hearing. I saw three of them s circling overhead, vultures against an orange sky. Just about a hundred feet until I reached the underpass. At the bottom of the slope, I tripped again, clumsy and unathletic. Knees stung, but I didn't care. I heard more shouts, more gunfire, and a strange whistling sound in the air. I ran again. Just twenty left. My legs pumped harder and I could see the cool darkness underneath the hard concrete structure. Just five more feet. I turned the corner into, a, into the safety of the underpass. I was not able to stop running until I was deep inside its cavern. Safe. I made it. I ran into the opening and I turned the corner. My body slammed into a hard mass and bounced back. Losing balance and falling backwards, I looked up. Six SWAT team officers, masked and faceless, stared at me. Stared down at me. The one whom I slammed into didn't hesitate. He brought down the baton with a muscled arm. Black club swept across my face and connected with my cheekbone. Crack sent a silver sliver of pain down my right eye and down my back. Then another. And another. This was how my cheekbone shattered in two. And the reason why I eventually went blind in my right eye. The nerve damage in my spine because of the blows I endured was also the direct result of what happened to me in that underpass. When the police officer's metal wand made contact with my body, I bit down on my tongue. Blood gushed into my mouth. The baton also flayed open my cheek. I knew the liquid that ran down my cheekbones was not sweat, and it was not tears. I rendered my dignity as I curled up into a ball at the feet of the officers. The dried moss my father gave me didn't stop the violence and it never could have prevented the officer from crushing my skull. In my pocket, I also carried a travel-size icon of the, Virgin of, Guad of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which my mother had given to me three months ago. 
when I had moved from home to the university. She was a little Guadalupe, drenched in gold and red, boldly stepped over the horns of a demon and radiating, her radiating light. Her eyes implied safety and love, but the protection I was supposed to receive from the icon never came to me. Even as I fell into a dark sleep and went deeper into shock, I remember feeling cheated by those useless objects and thought, and though I did not like to admit this, I hated my mother and father for instilling this false sense of security in me. I hadn't realized how superstitious my parents were until I thought about how a dried piece of moss and a laminated photo of a virgin could be so Utterly fucking useless. That was... <laughs> Thank you, King Wolfion, for following. Alright, uh, where were we? Yeah. That was, that was the little hateful thought that crept into my head. Even as my vision burst into white tears and the officer fractured my bones. He shouted many words at me. And his other companions shouted too. Words filled with hate and revulsion for me and the other, and for the other thousands of people that had gathered at Millennium that day. By my count, um, by my count, from the moment I lost Edgar until a SWAT officer split my face, four minutes elapsed. That in itself is a lifetime. That four-minute moment became one of the stars in the firmament of my life. Give me just a moment. I need to take a sip of tea here. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a, a, little, a little pause right here. Wow. <laughs> wow. That was like on, like straight on. Like it was like, like, what do y'all think? Like, seriously, that, I, wow. And the thing is, I lived in Chicago, I, I lived in Chicago, so I knew, like, these places, like, I could see where she was going. Like, I knew exactly where she was going. <laughs> it is, it was so intense. Oh, me, me, clan, me, clan, te cutli. Me, clan, me, clan, te cutli. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much for the follow there, uh, King Wolfion. All right. Here we go. So we're going to go pick up and continue going. That's all it was. Just a tiny moment. To dwell on my escape would be as if I asked you to stare up at the sky and fixate on only one star or planet and expect you to understand the full scope of the galaxy that contains it. It would be, it wouldn't be fair to you, me, to those who perished in Millennium Park or my story. There were other moments in my life that had an impact on those four minutes. They were moments made of interdependency, like a spider's web. Four days before the riots, I had celebrated my 19th birthday. My parents had picked me up at the dorm in Rogers Park. My brother, Jose Maria, flipped me the middle finger from the back seat as I got into the station wagon, and we drove downtown. We ate pizza at Uno's, and we blew out 19 candles on the cake. Oh, and I blew out 19 candles on the cake. Afterward, we decided to walk off the meal. We walked east on Ohio Street until we reached an underpass. We crossed its length, and when we emerged, the dark waters of Lake Michigan greeted us. It was too, much too late to be walking down the lakefront. Yeah, the character is 19. The, uh, you missed it. Like, um, King Wolfion, uh, the, the, the protagonist, is ni she's 19 years old. It was much too late to be walking down the lakefront, but there were, but there we were, all four of us, I, my parents, and my brother, alone at the east 
is alone at the eastern edge of the city where land meets water. My father, the tallest member of our family, walked up in front smoking a cigarette, and my mother walked between me and Jose Maria, our arms intertwined, our long straight hair brushed, brushing her shoulders. We walked north along the bike path and that ran up the shoreline of Lake Michigan. This part of Lakeshore Drive didn't close officially until 11 p.m., but even now, at 10.31, it was deserted. The lake's waves lashed on concrete wall, on, on a concrete wall next to our feet and up on our right. We could see the tops of the cars as they rushed down Lakeshore Drive. The lake remained black tonight. I dug in my pocket for my cell phone and pointed my camera toward the water. From up ahead, my father shut it out. Put it away, Clara. No photos. His voice rumbled, and the sweetness of the chocolate birthday cake I had just eaten earlier rose up to my throat in acid waves. Why do you have to yell at me? I thought. He was always yelling at me. He ignored this expression of rage in my face and squatted down, facing the lake a few feet ahead of us. I felt a tug on my shoulder and a pat on my arm. Put the phone away, my mother whispered. What he says. The light that shone from Navy Pier turned my father's profile into a shadow. He sat down on the concrete and patted the ground for us to join him. Birthday girl? Right on my left, he said. I sat cross-legged and the on the cold surface and we joined him on the other side. My father offered my mother a cigarette, but she shook her head. Not now, Adang, she said. Let's not stay out here too long. We have to be back to the car by around 11. You know that. It was important for us to run on time. Not only did I want to get back to the car in the parking lot, I also wanted to get back to the dorm as soon as possible. I wanted to celebrate all night. We had spent all week making big plans for the march at Millennium Park, and Edgar had borrowed an ID to buy beer and celebrate my birthday when I returned to campus. I hadn't told my parents about I hadn't told my parents yet about Edgar. I hadn't even told Jose Maria, but then again, I knew what would happen if I told my little brother. He'd be sure and be sure to notify my parents faster than the internet. During my first week at the dorms, Edgar had asked to borrow my screwdriver to fix his bridge. That's how I discovered he lived on my floor and on the other side of the dorm. Over the next few days, he kept cruising through my suite, and I kept traveling to his. We were both freshmen, and both of us held political change high on our list of values. Now, we were inseparable in our dorm. In the dining hall, in two classes we shared, and in our ways of thinking about change for the world. His face was boyish. His voice was not. We both joined the Occupy Liberation Front on the same day. The lake pummeled the breakers. I noticed Jose Maria was starting to resemble my father more than ever before as the angles in his face grew sharper and his hair grew out thick wavy and black. My mother unfolded her shawl to free up her hands. From her purse, she drew a small laminated image of the Virgen of Guadalupe, which she placed on her lap as she genuflected. She kissed the image of the Virgin, and then she put the image away. I couldn't see what my brother was up to behind her, but I could hear him tapping his hands on the concrete drumming the beat of one of his favorite metal songs. There we were, like hippies staring at the dim slice of the moon through the clouds. Birthdays were starting to become more and more like this. As the line in my parents' faces grew just a little deeper, and some of their weirdness got, well, weirder. In another part of the world, there is 
a lake where men once built a city, my mother said. This city floated on top of the water. A dream. Its towers reached the sky, and its architecture reflected the beauty of the natural world. The city's surfaces were red, blue, and gold, like the plumage of jungle birds. Jose Maria leaned over behind my mother's back, twisted his face into a knot. Here we go again, he whispered to me. Shush, I mouthed over to him. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, goodness. Tenochtitlan. Oh, Tenoch. Tenochtit. Oh, goodness. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's try this again. Tenochtitlan. All right, that's, I get it. <laughs> if anyone knows the phonetics for this, please type them out. I'll be more than happy to read them. Tenochtitlan. Oh, goodness. Why am I having so much trouble reading this? All right. Tenochtitlan. Oh, yeah. Tenochtitlan, I said, speaking loudly enough to make sure my father heard me. To make sure I had this knowledge etched into my memory. That's the city mom's talking about. Tenochtitlan. Or in other words, Mexico City. The place my parents were born. I was born there too, but I only lived there for a year. By the time I could walk, we were living here in Chicago. We probably won't live in Mexico City ever again, but it's good to visit Lake Michigan and remember that we once did, my father said. My father turned back towards all of us, and his face shone clear, despite the shadows cast by night. His skin was deeply grooved by lines and wrinkles, and his hairline had receded, but his eyes looked young to me. My uncles and cousins had always said that my father's eyes looked defiant. In my experience, his eyes were sometimes gentle, sometimes terrifying. Sometimes terrifying. Mostly terrifying. In any case, my father said, before your mother interrupted me, I was going to tell you what you need to do when you come to this lake, Clara. You're 19. You're old enough, almost old enough to be an adult. Dad, I work and I vote. I am an adult. I don't like being dismissed, I said. Fine. In this country, you're an adult. I'll grant you that. But your adulthood, in other terms, is still long, is still lo a long time away. So we come here on your birthday to think about this for a minute and to put our hopes in your future. Jose Maria stirred, crossed his skinny arms. Mom, you always let him go on and on. I mean, are you listening to this? As a general rule, your father's wrong about many things, my mother said, and I could see Jose Maria sit straight up with his own sense of validation. But in this case, you need to listen. You may not understand everything we're doing as a family, Clara, but it is your responsibility to grasp it. So sit back and listen. Yes, this means you too, Jose Maria. My father was a strange dude, and that meant he always carried strange stuff with him. He dug in his coat and pulled out a bundle of twigs and leaves. Pay special attention, birthday girl, my father said, using his free hand and pulled out a lighter from his trousers. I bring both of you here because the lake is a place you should respect. It's a place that's beautiful, but my mother always said that certain beautiful things should not be touched by any means. Lake Michigan has been here longer than you, me, or the men who built this city behind me. And though the lake gives life, the lake also has, al ha the lake also, has also dealt out death over the years. 
Never dive into the waters. Understand? I nodded so that we would just move on. Over the years, I nodded a lot of this away. I got good at scurrying past these talks. We live about we live about six miles from here, my father continued. That's just about the right distance to show our respect for these waters. If our house was any closer, we would be under its threat. Actually, that's not tr really true, Jose Maria said. Clara lives by the lake front, so she really ju is just a few hundred yards away from the shore. My brother, my mother smacked my brother on the back of the head, and he grinned as he shrugged his shoulders and chortled. But Jose Maria was right. The dorms were very close to the water, but I kept my mouth shut. This was not the time for interruptions. My father lit one end of the bundle of twigs, and it took a moment to catch fire. Soon its flames were leaping up its great up its length and my as my father held it away from his jean jacket and over the concrete lip. His hand stayed poised over the water. He spoke no words. He just let it burn until the flames caressed the tips of his fingers. And the fire lit our faces. He tossed a bundle into the waters, where the darkness swallowed it up. A hiss. Clara, you have to promise me you'll always stay away from this lake, my father said. Sure. My father turned turned toward all three of us. So, that's what you do when you come to show respect to the water, my father said. Learn it. Another order for me. I pressed my lips into a flat line. Impatience burned in my gut. I was feeling ready to leave this place. I wanted to be back in my dorm room, cracking open a PBR. I was over the spooky water and the hippie weirdness. My mother was the first to stand up, and she reconfigured her shawl, adjusting its length and folding and folds, bending to suit her will and keep out the wind. She shooed us along the bike path toward the parking lot. Pretty soon, we were inside the car, engine running and the heater roaring to life, and on our way to the dorms. We stared out the window at Lakeshore Drive, and the water was blue, very blue now. Its former black appearance was gone. Our family was not the most normal of families. I had always thought so, but as we walked back from the lakefront to the parking lot, I realized that not a single jogger, cyclist, or even cop had crossed our path while we sat on the concrete in front of the lake's waters. We had spent a half hour at the water's edge without a single interruption as my father tossed flames into the Four days later, the Millennium Riot became a reality. Oof. Man! <laughs> wow! All right. <laughs> so how's everybody doing? Are we enjoying story time? <laughs> I am really enjoying this. I, okay, LED, I'm, I, I have to tell you this. I... I am blind reading this book, as you can tell. I, I have not read this book yet because I wanted to read it for the first time. So I wanted to react. I wanted to kind of blind react to it as I read it. So I wanted to have like full on immersion and just like, just get it. <laughs> just taking a sip of my tea. All right, here we go. All right. All right, let's continue. All right, on to the next one. I know, right? <laughs> I know it's so good. By the way, if you're interested in purchasing 13 Secret Cities by Cesar Torres, it is available on Amazon and on LEDQueens.com. You can uh, order it on LEDQueens.com and get an autographed copy. I have an autographed copy of both <laughs> 13 Secret Cities 
and Nine Lords of the Night, which is the next book in the Coil novel series. But yeah, that's, that's where you can get the book. This has been a non-paid promotion. <laughs> All right, everyone, a place called Miklan. If I should paint my city, in, if I should paint my city in red, would you think that I bathed it in sacrificial blood? Sodium chloride veritas, lead like me, meditating on the Medusa, 1995, 5 AD records. Nothing about the events that took place on October 4th made sense. Four months, we tried to figure out how the riot started and who fired the weapons first. Their weapons first. We investigated the question: How could a peaceful march turn so deadly? I was one of the first responders at Millennium Park. I still don't understand the savagery I witnessed. Interview with Officer Michael Coleridge, Super Cops: How technology changed the war on terror by. Daily Fair, Neo Press 2016. The inequities of life. Parents are the first people to teach their sons and daughters shame. Internet meme. Point of origin circa January 2011. Fell into darkness. Something denser and thicker than sleep. When I awoke, pain crept down my back and through my jaw, my face and the top of my head. I was in a thick knot of hurt, and each breath I took sent deeper pain, coursing down my right leg. I tried to move my arms, but they were stiff, gnarled, determined to fight. Someone was dragging me along the ground. The underpass beneath Lakeshore Drive lay before me as it shrank away, and it shrank away as I moved further away. I was moving swiftly as if riding a sled. A person draped in shadow dragged me through the grass. If I craned my head toward the sky, I could see his or her head bobbing like a black bowling ball. We crossed Columbus Drive and pain ballooned inside me. All the work I had done to run, to escape the tear gas and the shooting inside Pritzker now undone. I was being taken back toward the place where it all started. We hit a bump on the ground and my body shook. And then there was and then there was worse pain coursing through all my body, in my teeth, and inside my guts. Night was descending and the orange glow of the street swirled with the sky. The person carrying me set me down on the ground on my back. Listen up, he shouted in the... No one gets moved until all EMTs move in. Bring the rest and put them here, next to this one. Careful with backs and necks. The person got down on his haunches next to me, he kept shouting orders as his gloved hand straightened out my legs beneath me. A hard black helmet and visor kept his face hidden. Then a strong smell of chemicals and, and pats on my cheek. Stay awake, stay with me, the man in the helmet said. I'll be right back. He stood up and ran off in the distance, the letters SWAT glowing on his back, and the noise of sirens, shouts, and motor vehicles drowned my world out. The pain in my head had become so intense, I forgot to cry. My pain threshold had always been low. Back then, small bruises and sprains could drive me to tears. This pain muted me. The edges of my vision were going fuzzy. I hope I could black out to forget all of this, to unfeel it all. Something loosened beneath me, and warmth dampened my jeans. I wet myself, or I was bleeding, not sure which. I was now on my right side in a fetal position, wet, and my head and neck on fire in pain. In the distance, I could see the turtle shape of Brisker Pavilion, 
lit by ambulance lights, and it took and I took a moment to glance at the grass around me. The sight in front of me made me scream. Just two feet away, two feet away from me, a tangle of flesh writhed like a pile of garbage. The shape of legs and arms was made arms made a sloppy, uneven, asymmetrical. Over the top of the heap, I spotted a portion of a torso and a chunk of parka. Then one of its arms folded over on its back like a broken doll. The arm poked sharply through the sleeve of the parka, most likely from the break in the bone. Faces at the top were lifeless. Something moved along the bottom of the pile. A portion of a face poked out from under the pile. Hands boot and face in the face deep inside the But the eyes stared out wide open feet. The eyes looked female. The cheek looked swollen. The pupils frozen in terror. Beneath the chin, I saw her, her brown arm missing its hand, the wound jagged and ringed a black, in black soot. Then a grunt from the mound. It was wordless, but filled with pain. Inside its notes, I heard deep sorrow and loss. Ah, uh, the voice said. Ah, it repeated, weeping. With every syllable. Oh, Maury. My eyes danced in circles, looking for someone to help me. Someone to help this person. Her mumble sent a chill down my neck, and I hoped the red lights washing over the metal skeleton of the park meant that ambulances would come help her soon. The pain in my body grew white hot. I swept my hand in front of me to touch the mound of people. I didn't know how I could accomplish... I didn't know what I could accomplish by doing this. But I could extend my left arm without triggering more pain. I felt, it, I felt under the brown boot and shoved it aside and the heel of my palm. It didn't move. Beneath, the voice continued, Hurry! Push! I used all my shoulder strength to shove the work boot and leg inside, and it finally gave way. Just twenty inches away from me, I saw her full face, older than mine, female, and her ebony skin slashed to threads, but somehow still recognizable as human. The eyes flat like paper, barely holding on. Her ragged breaths escaped as steam the steam through her matted hair. Sarah oh, Marie, the woman said. There was something in her mouth obstructing her words. I put my index and middle fingers between her lips and dug around. I found something firm and I pulled a chunk of her tongue, which had she had bitten through, fell into my palm. The sorrow in the woman's eyes swelled. Now I could hear her words clearly. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry, the woman said. And she stared out at me, but her eyes looked through me. There was no focus there. I... Yeah, she said. The last plume of steam left her lips. I had never seen a dead body in my life. I had never been this close to someone so brutally injured. I screamed. I tossed the lump of tongue away from me. My eyes were, st were still making contact with the dead woman. And now I was sure that she had joined the other three or four bodies on top of her in death. See the other injured people like me. 
laid flat out, some groaning, others silent as stone. The helicopters above me screamed dangerously close to the ground. And the words the woman spoke turned in my mind, downward, in circles like a spiral. God, I'm so sorry, she had said. Sorry for what? I thought. Sorry for... Sorry for all this death? Sorry for joining the march? Sorry for her sins? I tasted a bitterness in the back of my throat that remained... That reminded me of insecticide. And I realized the traces of the tear gas must still be dispersed through the air. My eyes stung, too. And it hurt to blink. Wind whipped around my legs, and I felt coldness in the spot where I had wet myself. My eyes went where there my eyes went there now to my gray jeans, and shame left in me. I, there was no shame left in me, just pain, a new creeping fear. The woman's eyes had been online for one moment. And then they weren't. Is this what death was? It's like a circuit moving into open position. My father had warned me about these horrors. And I could see him now, seated in his living room, smoking his cigarette, reminding my brother Jose Maria and I that if you give men weapons, they become butchers. The word butcher had felt crass when my father said it. But I thought of it now, as arms poked through piles of bodies, and the metal from the blood scented in the air. Scented the air. I didn't need to see the other dead people in the field. I had seen enough. The woman before me had no name, and I didn't want to have want her to have one. The redness of her cheeks invaded the skin. The matted hair wrapped in blood around her cranium like a cocoon. It was a shade of red filled with chaos. The massacre around me felt like it had no meaning, and I feared that this was all there would ever be. Pain, sorrow, the woman's sorrow, her sad apology to God, her body broken like her body, a broken pretzel under her felt a stir in my stomach and I remembered. When I was a freshman in high school and Jose Maria had only entered sixth grade, he yanked me by the hand to the front porch of our house, away from our father's close eye. Jose Maria finished from his back, fished from his backpack, one of his treasures. The library books he had, he liked to read. The title, Devil's Mask, the Richard's the Richard Speck story, sprawled in red ink over its gray cover. The nonfiction paperback had gone into great details about Richard Speck, who in 1966 entered a hospital in the South Side late at night and committed atrocities, atrocious things to eight of the student nurses who lived there. Eight women raped and tortured and killed and all at the hands of one man. When I had finished the book, I felt sick inside, as if I had swallowed a dozen needles, slept in my room with the lights on for weeks. Each time I remembered the murders, sharp pains came back to, the pl to plunge my midsection. The needles of pain solidified. Richard Speck had done nothing Richard Speck had nothing to do with the massacre before me, but I felt something neighborous, something sick on this wide lawn beneath the er, pavilion. And it felt just like on those nights I thought of that awful book my brother handed to me. The woman's face went slack. The wind picked up, blowing her hair over her lips. More voices shouted, and I saw an ambulance creep toward me, driving right over the sidewalk. 
and onto the grass, as its red lights dancing like pinwheels. How they whirled. My vision went gray at the edges, and then I fell into unconsciousness. Oh, sorry, I had to take a <laughs> I had to take a sip of tea at that moment. Oh, wow. 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 Damn. <laughs> Damn. Whoa. <laughs> LED, wow. Wow. That that's just <laughs> Thanks, Blizz. Thank you. All right, here we go. My eyes came into focus. Everything's gone white and blue. The halogens, the halogen lights burst into, um, the halogen lights burst in a wash of blue and they drew sharp shadows over the bed, the machines at my sides, the flood on the tray before me and the pale flowers at the end of the room. The television hung from the corner like a single black eye staring into the room the iv in my arm throbbed and my lips felt dry as dust <laughs> yeah it's very dark um but i'm okay with that it, it uh... <laughs> uh see here my mother walked into the room and i felt relief wash my insides Wow, I'm about to cry because of this family moment. Give, give me a second to have... Hold on, give me a second. Oh, man, I'm about to cry. I feel like I'm right there in the hospital. <laughs> give me a second. Oh, man, where's my tissue? Gotta get more. Oh, man. God, got me right in the feels, LED. Damn it. <laughs> oh. Goodness, like I felt relief. The I also felt relief when the mom when, when her mom walked into the room. Oh, let's go. Okay, let's keep going. My mother walked into the room, and I f and I felt relief wash my insides. As far as I could remember, she had always looked this way, rail thin, and her hair pulled behind her, as to say, "Let's do this." As she took each step into the room and toward my bed. Her eyes widened like saucers, and despair distorted her face into long lines. Her hands flew up to her temples, and her tears came down, the droplets braiding themselves up on her leather jacket. <laughs> I felt my very I felt my own tears come up, but something was wrong. I felt a throb inside my chest, and I realized it hurt. A lot. A whole fucking lot. To cry. My face was frozen into a mask. Why couldn't I wince? My father trailed behind my mother. He did his best not to let his eyes widen in shock. But I knew by the looking at him that whatever had happened to me was a lot to bear. Every part of my body felt puffy and stiff. I tried moving my arm to prop myself up, but instead pain greeted me. My parents took places on each side of my bed, their faces hovering over me while machines beeped behind them in a steady rhythm. What time is it? I asked. Ten in the morning, my mother said. She leaned over and kissed my forehead, eclipsing my view of the room. She pulled away. I could see my father's tears coursing down his face. She interlaced her hands on mine. I felt the tiny bumps of the rosary beads looped around her wrists as they touched my skin. I couldn't... I couldn't stop staring at my father, though. I had never seen him cry, not like this. If it's 10, where's Jose Maria? I said. 
I really wanted to see my brother. Jose Maria is at school, my father said. But isn't it Saturday, I said? Clara, you have been in the hospital for six days, my mother said. I looked down at my body with, in the powder blue sheets. Only my arm poked out. A bruised brown arm. The rest of me lay underneath. Pretty soon, my your pretty soon your aunts and uncles will be arriving. My mother said, "Your father and I wanted to spend an hour with you alone first, or they take over." Father said, "Because they will take over." My mother said, "They always take over." He said, "I'm gonna just take a pause right here for a second. I need, for those of you that are not of Latinx or Latino or Latina, you, your family is always in all your shit. <laughs> this is like this moment right here. It's how it is. You're like close knit, like. Bubble family, like parents and siblings. Don't, like, when something big like this happens. When something like this happens. I'm just saying. When something like this, when something big happens to you. Even if it's, like, minor surgery or anything like that. The rest of the family always has to. Exactly, exactly. Ay, mi hijito. Yeah, no. It, it, they you will get they will take over and swarm you it is like a love swarm and sometimes it's a telling you where you went wrong swarm depending on your family <laughs> but it this is typical <laughs> this is this is typical latino culture this is this is this is typical culture for us this is how family kind of is. They're like always in your sh in your business, especially when like that like like what happened to her was like major, but like it happens even with the smallest things. Like definitely with the smallest things. Oh, but back to our story. Where was I? Oh yeah. Um they always take over, he said. My mother checked her phone, ran to the door to see if they were here, and once she, and once she was satisfied satisfied enough she came back to to the bedside. <laughs> Have a seat, Juliana, my father said. You know my brothers and sisters never arrive on time. Clara, Clara, how do you feel? Cracked a smile as it it's as close as I could get to laughter. Like a champ, I said. My father chuckled and handed my mother a coffee. From my vantage point, my mom and dad looked small to me, like miniatures of themselves. Your injuries, my mother said. The doctors say your recovery will be slow. Juliana, let's start at the beginning. Clara deserves to know what happened. Said. And I'm sorry if they sound Cuban. It's just... I, I'm, I'm half Cuban, half Puerto Rican, so... like. They're gonna that sorry okay, <laughs> just in advance. Anyways, um, Juliana, let's start at the beginning. Clara deserves to know what happened. He said. My father took shallow breaths, and the wrinkles in his eyes bunched together. Doctor Ecker was just here before you woke up. He said. Whoever did this to you broke three ribs, punctured lung. You also bled internally. That is what most, what almost killed you. The blows to your head fractured your skull in two places. You suffered a brain injury, and the doctors did their best to work on your left eye. But you may not be able to see out of it. They have reconstructed your face, and... 
Dr. Ecker assured us their cosmetic surgeon is one of the best. I raised my left hand to touch my face. The texture of the bandage was soft, feathery. My whole face was bandage. This is, this is when the horror movie gets really good, I thought. Jose Maria would, would like that joke. My parents would not. Don't touch it, Clara, my mother said. The swelling will go down soon, but don't touch it. Could, could have been worse, right? I said. The face of the woman under the pile of bodies flashed in my mind. And I knew that could have been me, exhaling for the last time on the grass. My father took out his slender, took out his slender hand from his jean pocket, and pointed his index finger at me. Eyes went flat and cold. You, he said, you had to go to the march at Millennium Park. What the fuck were you thinking, Clara? Do you not have a brain up there? He tapped the side of his cranium, hard enough to make a solid thud. This was a serious matter if he was swearing. He never did, in some, did so in front of us. I was going to tell you, I said. When exactly? At your funeral? I don't even know what... Uh, I don't even know what happened, I said. The body count... Right now, he's at 300 or so, my mother said. Not to mention the thousands of injured, my father said. This was, this was the way to make change happen, I said. I know that, and you know that. It was my turn to push back. You think armed forces gunning down people m makes changes happen? My father shouted. You learn nothing from history then. He pulled up the plastic chair and he propped one leg up on it so I could see it up close. He loomed over the room, his short breaths thickening the air, tossed his jean jacket over the chair and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Then he rolled up his pants leg. I had seen the long scars on his arms and legs for many times. My father was 63 years old, but the strength in his arms and legs gave him the appearance of a man in his 40s. The scars bloomed on his skin like dull white veins. This is what revolution brings, Clara. I want you to get a good look at it, he said. A day go doesn't go by where I do not feel pain. Two bullets and a femur fractured in half. And my limp. You want to have a limp too? Uh, you wanted to have a limp too, didn't you? Adan, calm down, my mother said. No, I am not calming down, he said. His puffed up chest and my mother sat still a stone this was their dance i th thought i could change the world too some would argue you did my mother said and now look at wait Pla de, de lo, 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 lo. and now look how that loco lo, lo, turned out my country went to the dogs. Our country, Juliana. On October 2nd of 1968, my father, together with his older brothers, Jorge, his older brother Jorge, took the city bus to the plaza of Tatlecoco in Loclo. I'm, I swear I'm going to get this right. Tlatecoco. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> do my best in, Me in Mexico City. That day, many other students also organized to gather at the, the plaza to protest the, rep the repressions of the Mexican government. This was one of several protests that had taken place in Mexico City. 
That was a year that was filled with civil action and unrest. La del loco. Oh, so I did say loco. It was, it was loco. Okay. La del loco. Okay, cool. Thank you. La del loco. Lolco. Lolco. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. All right, let's go. Um, Civil action and unrest. Over that afternoon, 10,000 people, most of them students, gathered. What happened next was unclear, but my father told us helicopters had flown over the plaza. And at some point, someone fired flares from a nearby building. And then gunfire erupted. The army assaulted the plaza, killing hundreds of people. My father had been sitting on one of those steps of the Aztec ruins in the plaza, at, at the plaza when the shooting started, and he led Jorge and all those he could to safety, doing his best to avoid gunfire. As they ran into a nearby apartment building, a bullet shot Jorge clean through the head, two rounds pulverizing my father's leg. Jorge's death turned my father into a gaunt figure over the decades. There was a pain about Jorge that my mother couldn't describe and which my father hid from us. To mention Jorge was to summon my father's strongest silence. I had heard the stories of Tatlet Loco from my mother over the years because my father refused to talk about them. He only ever raised it as leverage during conversations like this. Like this one, where he remain, reminded me of how incompetent I was. My father's eyes shimmered as he bit down his, on his lips. He rolled down his pants and sleeves again, and he sat down on the chair. His former magnitude was gone now. He shook his head and sank into the white plastic. Your mother has something to say to you. Ed. So you're going to disengage from this, Alan? My mother said, Sure. Yell my ear off in the car about working as a team, and now it's m me that's the harbinger of bad news. Mom plays the good cop. This was your idea, he said. So here we go, team. So here we go, team. You get to tell Clara the big news. My mother swept her hair back with her fingers. Unhappy with the results, she pulled out a brush from her purse and ran it in strokes away from my face. Each brush stroke hurt my head a little, but I let her go on. Our eyes went very dark. She never dropped them from mine. They're calling the event on Millennium. They're calling the event the Millennium Riot. The police and the other troops were there. Who were there shot the protesters many times. There was a rumor that a few of the protesters in the crowd might have shot back. But it's all on the shaky cell phone videos, and the country is in chaos, pointing fingers. Really? I said. I felt a sick tread, but also I, a sense of victory in my heart. Change. Was it possible? I saw a few clips of the start of the riot, my mother said, and I had to stop. There was so much gas, and there was shot start... And when the shot started, I kept on thinking, she's dead. She's dead. I had to turn it all off. We were very lucky to get you back, my father said. We had no way of knowing if you were there, buried beneath somebody. I escaped the park when the gas canisters hit the stage. I got pretty far, and then... I trailed off. My father had warned me 
to stay away from the lake. And that's exactly where I had run. I had run. My mother's side of the family kept many secrets. So did my father's. I kept this bit of information from him. At least for now. I couldn't stand to see him lose his temper like he had just moments ago. Do you remember who did this to you? My mother said. Men in uniform. How many? Not sure. It, it happened fast. I, I ran into them, and then I can't remember much after that. It was true. Dark the dark visors had made the people in uniform anonymous faceless. Anonymous faceless. And then a baton swung. I did remember the baton. I think they were the same people who dragged me back to the pavilion where they brought the rest of the dead and injured said couldn't keep everything secret i decided to share this part of the story before my mother had a chance to ask me they put me next to a pile of bodies there was a woman at the bottom and what i saw was horrible sobbed lara you don't have lara you don't have to said my father it's okay, Clara, my mother said. Tell us what you saw. Details matter. Needed a little space, but my mother would be hurt if I told her not to crowd me in with her body. It was better just to get it over with. She was the last one alive under that pile of bodies till she wasn't. Oh. Who saw her die. That's what you're telling me? My mother said. Nodded. We all fell silent for a moment, and my mother tightened her grip on my hand. My father paced around the room as if he were formulating something long and intricate. Dug in his brown leather bag, he pulled out a petri dish, which I recognized immediately. Handed he handled these often at his job at the botanical gardens. He kept a few at home for odd projects in our back porch. The dish was lined with a clear agar and white spirals coiled around its surface like the trail left by an ice skater. My father pulled out the tray built into the bed. He placed the disc right in front of me. Like some sort of present. This is fungal spiral. He traced the white tendrils over the plastic. They call this little beauty the yellow gill damsel. Its job is simple. It thrives off of dead things. Dead wood. Dead plant matter. But its favorite is dead flesh. This powerful little fungus spreads itself in the ground, and when things go to die, it extends its tendrils like these. The tendrils made me want to pee. Don't fear it, my father said. These swirls, Clara. This is what death looks like from a microscopic level. What you saw when that woman died was also death. At a macroscopic level, you saw her take her last breath, and out it went, air into the air, possibly in little spirals of it, just like the ones here. Hurry, my mother said as she brandished her phone in my father's general direction. Dolores texted me to say she'll be here within minutes. Clara, be sure to keep your mouth shut when you see uh, your aunt when, uh, when your aunt gets here. The odor from the petri dish corkscrewed its sweet and must be sent into my nose. Thinking about the dead woman is making me sick. Thinking about the dead woman is making me sick, Dad. I said. Wish she would take this thing away. 
That's the whole point, Clara. He said. I'm afraid I can't. After the riot, the woman that died in front of you? The hospital? I am sure you think morbid events are following you. This very scent is shadowing you. No, I think you're putting morbid thoughts in my head. That's my girl, my father said. You don't let anyone push you around. Well, I'm pushing this fungus back to you, I said, and I put it back in his bag, which lay on the bed. It took me some time to do it because my arm still ached, but I did it without his, his help. When I was done, my father reached inside the bag and placed it back on his lap. I knew we could go on forever like this, taunting each other. My father stopped pushing the dish back. Do you recall the early hours of the morning of your 13th birthday? He said. No, not really. Well, let me think about it, I said. Not hard. I still shared a room with Jose Maria back then. My father had painted the walls bright green so we could have a color that suited us both. at us both I went back to the uh, to that memory of a small fragment up and a small fragment appeared like a glint of metal inside a cave I remembered waking up in the middle of the night and I had looked at the clock Jose Maria lay curled into a ball snoring it was about 4 a.m. my stomach stirred with hunger pains and my mouth was dry at the far end of the room, a light flickered. Two figures sat at the far end of my bedroom, and they watched me from a corner. I remember wanting to scream. My parents, my parents, now I remember they were with, they were there with me. They sat side by side, lit by the glow of a veladora candle. My father waved at me, smiling, and I felt confusion, shock, and fear. Go back to bed, Clara. There's still more time to sleep, my father had said. We lived in Little Village, where street noise lasted all night. But I remember that night had actually been quiet. My mother had wrapped her shawl around her shoulders and tucked me back in bed. I wanted to ask what they were doing here, but I was mute, drowsy, inert. This was not a happy birthday memory, no sir. My mother had leaned forward into the soft glow of the candle. When you step inside the palace of the skulls, just remember, we're always with you, my mother had said. She st had stood up then, and she crossed the room with an odd grace, as if her feet were being carried by a gust of wind. Her face above mine had calmed my fears a bit. I felt her dry kiss on my forehead, and then I was dissolving into deep sleep again, that cocoon of nothingness that arrives with sleep over two. When you step inside the Palace of Skulls. When you step inside the Palace of Skulls. When you step inside the Palace of Skulls. Surely this had just been a dream. Today was the first time in the memory had sprang back into my hands like a found object. That morning, I had a scary dream, I said. I woke up and you two were in the room with me. You tucked me back in bed. My mother nodded toward my father in silent approval. He looked eager now, excited. If he could, he would have lit a cigarette. He liked to celebrate with smoke. It wasn't a dream. We were actually there with you, my father said. That night was as important as the day you were born. That night. 
you survived a rite of passage. Come again, I said. A rite of passage, my mother said. It was actually your second rite of passage, Clara, my father. No, it was actually your second rite of passage, Clara, my father said. There was more than one, my mother said. The first one is birth itself, my father said. When a baby is born and arrives into the world alive and breathing, the first rite is complete. The child has survived the emergence from the matter of the universe and exits the womb through the mother. And the second one, uh, this is what you talked about. The night of seeking, I said. So she does remember, my father s said to my mother. In our family, we began to leave childhood behind at 13. But, a but according to my father, true adulthood didn't arrive until the 26th year. Jose Maria also passed this right when he was 13. My mother said, It begins in the middle of the night when the sun is on the other side of the planet. It is very simple. During that night, a dream arrives. Then the rite begins inside a dream. My father nodded and my mother continued. That night, we watched over you while you dreamt. We were there to protect you. That's what all parents do f have to do for their children on the 13th year. Your dream journey is all on your own, of course, and no parent can accompany their child inside the dream. We simply wait at the bedside, making sure the children are physically unharmed. That night you woke up from sleep. Just for a moment or so, an interruption like this is normal. But it was our job to make sure you went back to sleep, to make sure you completed the task. Which is, I was so damn impatient already, the task of the 13th year is the one where each person goes out and seeks his or her tonal. The search can lead you to many places, many of them very dangerous. My tonal. I hadn't heard that word in many years. This word also came back to me like a message in a bottle. Tonal. I remembered the tonal in stories that my father told me about his mother in Oaxa. Oaxaca. And the stories of his uncle's travels in the jungles of Yucatan. All the stories led back to the same word. Tonal. The tonal was an animal or symbol that corresponded to each person's birthday. Some people got the deer, some got water, and some the monkey. There were 20 in total. These had always been in little stories my mother and father told me growing up. But it had been years since they had mentioned tonal in my presence. And if I went out to find my tonal, then what is it? I said, I'd always wished for the rabbit. That's the problem, my father said. You came back without one. Your mother and I never saw one come back to, to the room with you. Is that like having no soul? I said. My father stared out of the windows into downtown Chicago and cried in silence. I tried sitting up. My heart was racing and aches in my back were roaring back to life. Sit back, my mother said. You're not well enough to sit up yet. I want Jose Maria here right now, I said. I'm not liking this conversation. It's true. Jose Maria was nothing close to being what I called normal, but at least he could corroborate the utter weirdness in our family. I could surely use his backup now. I needed him here to bring some sanity into the room. Timing is not on our side, my father said. 
The painkillers they are giving you interfere with your lucidity. Normally, we would explain it all this explain all this history to you without the intrusion of a single foreign chemical in your body. But your mother and I don't have a lot of time. Your father and I, my mother added, we're worried. <clears throat> we're worried you're headed in a very wrong direction, my father interrupted. Give me a second, pouring some coffee. I mean, tea. Pouring some tea, not coffee. <laughs> All right, give me a second while I prepare my tea. Ooh. What's everybody think so far? Wow, right? <laughs> Ooh. Let's see here. Hey, Japs! Yeah, I know. I gotta get that tea. I gotta soothe the throat. I'm feeling like it was going dry there a little bit. All right. Well, Jabs, welcome. Well, you did, and we're in the middle. We are in the middle of reading 13 Secret Cities, written by Cesar Torres, who happens to be in the chat, also known as LED Queens. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask him. I say, you're such a good book reader. I could see you working on... <laughs> Yeah, that would be fun, honestly. I, I I dig it. Um. By the way, since we're taking a little minor break right now, a little tea break right now, while I'm waiting for my tea to cool down just a little bit. If you want to read Thirteen Secret Cities and the rest of the Coil novel series, you know, like Book Two, which is Nine Lords of Night, you can go to ledqueens.com and order yourself a copy that's autographed. If you just want the book, you can go to Amazon and order it off of Amazon. It also is available as a Kindle book. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for, for contributing to the 30,000 Spronx to make this stream possible. Um, so actually what we're going to do, we're going to, what we're going to do is, let's see here. Uh, wait, I'm going to bookmark this right here. Oh, I love that. It's a little blue bookmark. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take a short break. I need to wait for my tea to cool, but feel free and ask, ask, ask him questions about what you just heard. So, and I will be back. I just need to take, give myself a, uh, Local break and get get some fluids. <laughs> I will be back.
All right, and we're back. And I see that we've been having a very interesting uh, conversation about uh, mythology. I actually have heard of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, Quetzalcoatl. I th I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Quetzalcoatl. Um, or Quetzalcoatl. Um, but that... Quetzalcoatl. Yeah, Quetzalcoatl. Yeah, that's, that one I have heard growing up. And I've seen images of Quetzalcoatl. Um, also, Scooby-Doo has a movie regarding Quetzalcoatl. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I have had those images growing up. Of I recently found out, and I don't think I've mentioned this before, um, talking to my parents. And I don't know, maybe it's just my family or, you know, maybe other Latinos there uh, or Latinx people like me can maybe, um, may can maybe relate, um, but my family tells me things after the fact. And so it's like, not until I start, like, they, they never, like, outright teach me things. Until I all, all of a sudden have it, I'm like doing like research and stuff. And then like, I'm asking them and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Fulano de tal had this, that, and the other. Oh, your third cousin from like fourth removed or whatever had that and blah, blah, blah. Or your abuelo or your abuelita had this thing and the other. It, 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 it so okay so regarding that before i go off in a tangent i found out from my family because i was kind of curious about if there was any taino ancestry in my family and i come to find out i do have taino on both my mother's side and my father's side how much <laughs> exactly, exactly. Fulanito de tal, comadre. No, <laughs> no lo vas a creer. Yeah, I know. And, but so yeah, I recently found out that I have Taino in Taino ancestry. And so now I'm curious to find out more about that ancestry. But of course, no one in my family can help me with that, so now I have to rely on the internet to teach me about this ancestry that I now just found out that I have. So that's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting thing. Um. So oh, let's see here. Let me see if my tea's now warm enough for me to be able to sip. Ah, oh, yes, perfect temperature. All right. So without further ado, we're gonna. Go back into the story now that we had this little tangent. Um. Oh, really quick, LED. I wanted. To, uh, I wanted to ask you really quick while we're have this little break. Um. Would you be okay if we did this as a series? Oh, I I like to drink a very special blend of jasmine dragon pearl tea. With lavender dreams. So, so basically, I like to drink a garden. Long story short, like I, I like to drink a garden. I like herbal teas. Yeah, I like lavender. I like lavender and jasmine. Green teas are good. Uh, but yeah. So I want to ask you. Would you be okay if uh, I read this as a series like, and read the entire book on stream as a series of streams? Because as long as you're okay with it, we'll keep doing it. Um... Yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I was planning on reading Nine Lords of Night as a story time as well. Um, my original plan was to read some of it 
and then let everybody else kind of like go read the book themselves. <laughs> but I, as long as you're, like I said, as long as you're okay with it, I will read this as a series then. Um, we will do this as a series and then we'll go straight into Nine Lords of Night. All right, awesome. All right, so with LED Cesar Torres's blessing, we are going to continue and the parents are going to sound Cuban because, you know. Uh, here we go. Your father and I, my mother added, we are worried you're headed in a very wrong direction, my father interrupted. Joining the OLF and going to the protest was only a first step. I'm worried that you carry not just my stubbornness, but also my temper and maybe even my bad luck. I have to ask you to stop your involvement with the OLF. What do you know about OLF? I said. You'd rather me stay complacent. You'd rather me stay complacent and superficial. These are the same people that hacked the nine one one phone system and the Millennium riot started. That disruption kept ambulances from arriving on time. People died as a result, Clara. Before you fight me on this, you need to get the whole story. I don't need anything. They say that the OLF has put a contract out on the city's politicians. This information's coming directly from OLF. Do you think you're not going to bring more violence and anarchy about? What does this have to do with the... To what does this have to do with the tonal anyway, Dad? Get to the point. My father took his seat on the bed. My mother pulled her chair closer to where I lay, her chin almost touching the rail. That night, my mother said, we saw you going to deep sleep and find your tonal. When, when you returned, something was different. You, you looked afraid, stunned. You did not look happy. And that's when we knew you didn't find it. If you had been successful, you would have told us all about your animal over the next day, as all children do during the right. Instead, instead, you brought something else back. As far, uh, instead, you brought something else back. As your father and I know, no one has ever brought anyone or anything back during the journey. Unheard of. Finding the tonal happens in the dream, and the right ends in a child understanding the knowledge of her tonal. While we waited in your room, we saw this other thing that came through. It stared at us through windows. We couldn't make out the size or the shape, or its shape, except for two eyes that shone like headlights on the highway. The eyes, Clara. They were the size of dinner plates lit from within. Whatever owned those eyes did not like us, and it fixated on you. I don't believe any of this, I said. You don't have to, my mother said. You get to make up your own mind. All you have to do is hear us out. It had always been this way in our family. Our parents just gave us what they knew and what they believed, but it was up to me and Jose Maria to make up our minds. This was the very reason why I still didn't believe in half of the tales from the Bible. While they did. My father dragged out a green disc from his leather bag. It was nothing but a tangle of weeds coiled like a snail shell. Another fungus, I said. Better, he said. He drew his finger along its surface. We all took we all took the trip to find the tonal, he said. We take the trip to the day we were born, when we are thirteen and when we are twenty six. 
On the 26th year, we see the tonal and embrace it. Whether it's jackrabbit, a jackrabbit, a crocodile, a jaguar. This is how we become full adults. These three trips from birth. Your first trip would be akin to origin point on the piece of lichen. Of this lichen. It's where things begin. They say that lichen, that lichen like this one, have access to the mysteries of the universe. Sort of like a key. But it's never worked like, but it's never worked for me. What's important is the shape that you see here. The second trip is further along the edges here. Where the texture is still smooth. Where you brought back that creature at the age of 13, we didn't know what it meant. But I am afraid I have learned it. You are living close, very close to death and violence, Clara. And I'm worried that you are actually enjoying the chaos. I am worried that the lines that you are creating are closely intertwined with something with terrible and cruel intentions. You like blood. Get off my face. So offended. You're saying I got contaminated? I said. My father shrugged and shook his head. Something has to change in order to cleanse you. He said. Your father's proposing that you take drastic measures, Clara. My mother had said. Sadness tinted in her voice. And I both think you need to take your third trip early. Seven years early. No one spoke for a few moments. The machines at my bedside punctuated the time with their chirps. Because the thing that you brought with you on your 13th year, my mother said, it was from Miklan. Miklan. That was another word I hadn't heard in years. A day of found objects. Will the fun ever stop? I sighed. But I thought it was just an old fairy tale, I said. Old? Old, but with a, st but a story with legs, my father said. What we know about Miklan, we know from what my grandparents taught me. And what they learned from their grandparents. And on and on. And I only learned it from your and I only learned it from your father when I married him, my mother said. Direct knowledge of Miklan is forbidden, said. And yet something drew itself to you when you sought out sought your tonal. I suspect you might have visited Miklan in your thirteenth year dream. It's unusual, but possible. I have lived in anxiety for the past six years, wondering why this happened and where your mother and I went wrong. Suddenly, I wanted some more hardcore drugs so I could just tune all this out. Give me all the drugs, somebody. But my mom and dad were relentless. Cleansing is possible, my mother said. Handling this type of creature, aiming this kind of creature, can only be done by an adult, my mother said. And you are not an adult yet. Far from it, my father spat. Immature and obstinate. Heat rose from my face and I clutched, clutched the bed sheets with rage. All the years in school, the work I did for social justice, the volunteering, these meant nothing to these people I called my parents. Perfect grades, the part-time jobs, they were nothing, nothing, nothing. But I am an adult. So much more adult than you, with your old ideas and creepy ways. I don't want to be here anymore, I said. I'm not used to talking to my parents in such a terse manner, but my tongue moved faster than my heart. Get out of my room and take your new age superstitions with you. See you, Juliana, my father said in his voice, gathering steam. My mother started gathering her things as he hovered over her. I told you this was going to happen. Everything we do, these two, they just toss it aside. 
My mother had placed my cell phone next to the bed. And I picked it up, oblivious to my parents' departure, texting Jose Maria as fast as I could. They've gone completely batshit, I texted him. My mother and father reached the door. Clara will be gone for a couple of hours. But we'll be back with the rest of the family. We'll have more time to talk in the next week or so. Just be ready for the journey. Won't be easy. Get the fuck out already. The door shut and I let out a huge sigh of relief. That was perhaps the most awkward moment I had ever lived through. None of this was fair. My body was broken and my face hurt even though the veil of painkillers through the veil of painkillers. In all, in all this, it hadn't occurred to me to look at myself. There, along the bottom row of icons, was the camera app on my phone. If I, had point, if I pointed it to myself, I'd get a glimpse of my bandaged face. I brought the phone up in the air, and I held it there, my hand shaking. In the end... I didn't have the heart to tap the icon. I set the phone down on the blanket and resented the lack of clarity in my head. Pain killers and fairy tales, these two things made a deadly combination. Why mess with my head? Why? And why? And my father? Shouldn't he have thought better of what he said to me about my 13th birthday? Why have me recall a memory that felt so hazy, so fragile? It was just a dream anyway. Just a dream of my parents with a candle in, my, in the room on my birth, day of my birthday. They couldn't just let it rest. What was their urgency? They couldn't wait until I got out of the hospital? I was going to get back, from this, get back up from this bed to heal. So I can get back to the real world. To learn what exactly took place in Millennium Park. And more importantly, what was next? No response yet from my brother on my phone. But as I flipped towards the bottom of the inbox, I found dozens and dozens of unread messages. Messages from mem members of our chapter of the OLF. Dozens of messages from strangers that knew I had been hospitalized wishing me well. These people identified me by my screen name, Shira, on the internet forum, forums and Twitter. I didn't feel so alone. I had a lot to catch up on and lots to plan. For the next few hours, I could forget about my parents and come back to reality where I could touch solid matter where action was still needed. I pieced a few things together. The 5,000 protesters at Millennium had pushed the lawn capacity to the brim, and the use of SWAT and military forces had actually been quite routine. In fact, the development had the deployment had looked very similar to that of the May 2012 NATO protests, also in Chicago. According to the reports about the Millennium riot, gunshots had been fired at 4:54 p.m. Um, the media reports said that the first shots came from armed protesters in the center of the pavilion, while Twitter reports and bloggers pointed to the sound in the video clips put blame on the troops situated in the north side of the park. Behind the stage of the pavilion, the rest of it, the thousands of bodies trapped and trampled, the use of force from SWAT teams and the police was more or less as I remembered. The mayor's sit down and shut up ordinance from 2012 was already kicking into place. Those who could be identified in the video footage were already seeking damage against any organizations that took part in the protest. While the investigations continued, I forgot to ask my parents if the investigations were trying to reach me, but I figured if that was the case, I would know soon. I saved several images into my camera roll so I could take a better look. 
an aerial view of the park. It was a high resolution image that I could see pinch and zoom as I needed. Here I could see the places where the aftermath took place. There, along the southern edge of, Pritz of the Pritzker Pavilion, the first ambulances began to treat the chemical burns from the tear gas and to provide aid to those who had been shot and in injured. There, in the middle, was the worst chaos. And then up on the northern shoulder of the pavilion, a span of grass where the armed troops laid out the bodies of the dead. I stared at this diagram for some time, and I scrolled back, going back, to look at the photos of the piles of the dead. The twisted feet, the broken fingers, the bloody heads were so familiar to me now. That flat patch of grass was the place where I had been dragged. This was the path carved out in dead bodies, laid out by the troops and armed cops. They had placed me in the same zone as the dead. When you step inside the Palace of Skulls. When you step inside the Palace of the Skulls. When you step inside the Palace of the Skulls. I let go of my phone and, I, and it hit the floor with a dull crack. I was breathing fast and sweating under the hospital gown. I fought back the urge to vomit. When you step inside the Palace of the Skulls, my mother had said. When you step inside the Palace of the Skulls, my mother had warned me. I considered calling my parents now to tell them to come back. I would eat my words, but seeing them might calm me down. I was scared. My finger lay on the call button, but I never tapped it. There, on the blanket, lay the coiled leechin my father brought with him. I ran my fingers over it, grasping it with both hands like a tiny steering wheel. Its edges were pebbled like a lizard's skin. I turned and turned it in my hand, knowing that the repetitive motion might help me bring my breathing back to normal. As I spun the leechin, a damp taste filled my mouth. It arrived from the front of my mouth, filling my tongue and my palate with its oily scent. It was a smell unlike any I had ever known before. Though some of its notes were easy to identify, it tasted copper and sulfur, and a sweet thickness like a sick sweetness like fruit gone bad. It was a taste that reminded me of shit, but perhaps worse. This was the taste of graves and swamps, and the taste of burning human hair. The tighter I gripped the coil, the more intense the smell became. I retched, and pain exploded in my back and in my head. I tossed the coil of legion at the hospital curtains. As soon as it was out of contact with my hands, the taste of rotted meat vanished from my mouth. I was panting again. While my heart sought to explode from my chest, a nurse showed up at the door. Everything all right? I said, I thought I heard something. You did, I said. I dropped my phone. Can you get it for me? Thank you, I said as she slid it onto my palm. Before she could make it out of the room, I was already typing with fury into my phone, scouring through search engines for the word Miklan. Ooh, we're now at Rhinoceros. Okay, all right. So now we're at Rhino... Rhino... Rhinoceros... Was I... Re Rhinoceros. Yeah, rhinoceros. I wonder if it's like pronounced it so weird. <laughs> I don't know why my brain just went weird when I when I was like, no, that's right, that's the correct spelling. Why am I why am I trying to sound it out like it's a weird? <laughs> All right, here we go. Here about. This 
Okay, about the steel that stands at the plaza of the three cultures in Mexico. The stele, sorry. About the stele that stands at the plaza of Mexico. I know! It's an English word, but for some reason I tried to pronounce it weird. I don't know why, why not, I don't know why I did that. I don't know why my brain did that. Anyway, so, so about the stele that stands at the plaza of the three cultures in Me Mexico City. It exists, it exi exits, no, it exists squeezed between the church of Santiago de Tetlacoco. No, Tetle, ah, Tlatelolco, rows of mid rise apartment buildings and the ruins of the Aztec Empire. The stele pushes itself up from the ground like a magical object. Filled with men's words and runes that are readable to those of us who speak Spanish. In this tele, we recognize that the plaza was a place of life and much death. Mexico's ancient marketplace was one converted into a place of violence dur during the Tetlaloco massacre of 1968. Well, I'm just going to keep tongue twisting that word. Uh, today, it flourishes as the home of the 21st century Me Mexico. It is in this very spot that the masked identity of the Mexican people lies hidden, yet also exposed through the power of language. Architect Carlo Fuente. Journal of Architecture and Design, Volume 56, May 2012, page 89. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, once your authority, now your parasitic host. Motherfuckers grab your, their scepter and pull the trigger. Archangel, Lyra destroys a shrunken god. The Violet Album, 2008, Reckless Records. She caught the shawl as she spoke and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the White Queen came running wildly through the wood with both arms stretched out wide. As she were flying, and Alice very civilly went to meet her with the shawl. Lewis Carroll, Through the Looking Glass, 1871. I ran my card through the reader, and I walked up the platform to wait for my train. The wind whipped my face, and my hair lashed my skin. It felt good. This was my strange new skin, and it takes some getting used to. The Loyola stop on the red line was the place that severed... Oh, that served as my entry point into other parts of the city. It wasn't the prettiest of stations. This is true. This is actually true. It is. Loyola Stop is one of the prettiest stations. It wasn't one of the prettiest stations, but the sun came down into fat yellow beams in the late afternoon. I was free of the hospital, able to breathe the city air. I wore my lucky brown boots and a plaid skirt that matched my vintage blouse. My makeup was a simple gash of black across my eyelash line and a layer of mascara. I could walk now, though many spots across my back and my legs were still tender to the touch. I sat near the sliding doors, and in my mouth the taste of Edgar's mouthwash. The Millennium Riot was weeks behind me now, and since then I had crept up to Edgar's dorm room in the early mornings when it was still dark out. His roommate slept right through my knocks at his door. Edgar would open the door, his face in a moon in the in a moon oh his face a moon in the dark of his room. His boxers hanging low on his hips and the thatch of hair on his chest wild like reed. Once I was inside his bunk, the sex was short, sweet, pungent. The pain in my back faded away when I came and kept my panting short and shallow so we wouldn't wake up his roommate. 
I had been visiting his dorm room in this manner for weeks. In those moments before the sun came up, we didn't talk about what had happened at Millennium Riot. We didn't talk about the media frenzy around us, and we didn't talk about the heightened security around campus. Edgar was no longer part of our chapter of the OLF, and I didn't press him for details why. They had been different, though. When we finished, he lay in my armpit sweating. I decided to ask him about what had what happened. I needed us to talk. I asked him what he remembered from the Millennium Riot, but when I did, he just stared at me. How do you ask me, he said. Body stiffened with anger. He's trying to simply forget. It was fine by me. I, I didn't ask any further. Once was enough today, I left. I went to my class later in the morning, then to my job at the library for a couple hours. At dinner time in the dining hall, I ran into Edgar again. He was smiling again. He looks happy. What a change. Maybe we could go to a movie. I can introduce you to my friends and crew, he said. We can all hang out. I had no idea where he got this idea that we could start hanging out. We no longer socialized anywhere. Not in the dorms, not in class. This was new. I'd rather not. But why? We get together virtually every day. We're always doing that together. Not as together as you think. Oh, that, I said. I'm fine with the th way things are right now, I said. You mean... Oh, you mean where you just use me for sex and then you leave me. I don't know how to answer that. I know things have been, haven't been easy since what happened, but we, we can still be close, Clara. It's just sex, I said. Just sex, Edgar said. He finished a glass of soda. Went up to the self-serve machine for a refill. He was done. Walked past my table. Smile was gone. And went to sit on the other side of the dining hall. His back turned away from me. Maybe he walked away. Maybe when he walked away, he called me a whore under his breath. But I knew that in that past two weeks, I had lost interest in what I had imagined to be my infatuation with him. Before the Millennium Riot, I had trailed Edgar like a shadow through the lecture halls, the student union, the dorm room halls. But now I could only think about Miklan and whatever I could learn about it. I needed to keep some distance from Edgar myself. Now that I had a piece together some of the events of the riot, I had learned that when we got separated as we held hands, Edgar too ran off to find an exit from the rounds that were being fired in, in the preschool pavilion, and he successfully ran onto the street before the tear gas arrived. Police officers arrested him on the spot. He was released later that night. He had survived unscathed by the violence. He never visited me in the hospital, and when I returned to campus, I expected to find messages from him. There were none. I learned that he had quit the Occupy Liberation Front altogether. He removed my name, as well as other many others in OLF from his Facebook account. I asked him in the dorm one day how we had lost we had lost hand contact and become separated during the riot. For all he was, you were the one that let go of my hand, Clara. Those words hurt me, but the further I pressed him to talk, the further away he moved. Had I been dumped or had nothing been there between us in the first place? And why did Edgar think that my morning visits meant so much? Maybe I was real. Maybe I really was a whore. I considered the idea for a second, then I laughed to myself. Of course, I was not. But it was probably net. It was probably never. Uh, but I would probably never find out what Edgar really felt for me. During my return to campus, I had dealt with police interviews and my classwork. 
as well as a short as well as short meetings at our OLF chapter. Our attendance was not the same anymore. Besides Edgar, we lost 40 other members. I knew fear kept many of us away, but even after what had happened, I wasn't going to give up. In fact, I knew that Millennium Riot was only confirmed for me my path. I had to continue with OLF and the movement. I ignored my coursework, putting off my reading and skipping discussion section. I spent my time instead in a corner of the library, deep in a sea of information. In the mornings, I read every news post about the OLF and the Millennium Riot investigation. I read every blog and every tweet and watched all the videos I could about the riot and its aftermath. I stayed up till four in the morning reading, absorbing, and reading some more. The latest death count was 309. And the debate over who shot the first, who shot first, was not over. Those protesters who had brought firearms were either dead or in custody, and a federal investigation was underway. At night, I slept in pain, my back aching, and my skin breaking out in a sweat. When I slept, it was only a, for a couple hours. I avoided taking too many painkillers. And it always disliked pills, but as a result, I stared out of my room into the orange-black glow of the city lights and cuddled my insomnia. My roommate Morgan slept soundly as usual. Fog rolled over the bedroom window each night. The dark pressed behind it. Winter was approaching. But I had still want, but I had still wanted and needed sex. The mornings with Ex Edgar, the mornings with Edgar helped me start my day. It helped me feel like I was free, like there was no shadows pressing down on me. Though the sky and no blades of sharp pain running down my spine and inside my skull. The train station whizzed past me, and a gush of cold air filled the subway car each time the sliding doors stood open. On the streets below, the police cars saturated traffic. This the riots, all eyes were on Chicago, and it was now common for anyone to get stopped and searched during all hours of the day. Thorndale, Bryn Mawr, Irwin, finally... Lawrence. I had arrived at my destination. I walked down the greasy stairs and turned onto the street. It was much too early for the doors to open, but there, lined up around the corner from the entrance from the Aragon Ballroom, a hundred fans sat with their backs against the wall, checking their phones complaining about the wind and the cold, anticipating their entrance into the concert hall. The Aragon eclipsed the whole block with its Moorish architecture style and the deep layers of soot and grime that had tarnished it over years. As I walked up to the line to the look for my brother, oh, as I, as I walked up to the line to look for my brother, I was already regretting my clothing choices, but these were, but these were the most hardcore rhinoceros fans, and here I was, caught in the crosshairs of these fashionistas who waited in line. I didn't have any tattoos to speak of, and the indigo of my blouse and the red checkered pattern of my skirt were all wrong for this crowd, and it was too late to go back home and change. It was what it was. I walked, to, I walked quickly down the line, avoiding the pressure of the eyes that bore down on me. Three-fourths of the way back in line, I spotted my brother, Jose Maria, 
I'd been waiting three weeks for this moment where he and I could see each other alone, away from our parents' house and I away from campus. Samaria smoked a cigarette under his hoodie, letting out a big gulp of smoke. One leg kicked out in front of him and the other bent so he could rest his cell phone on top of it. Ace. Looked at me with his wet red eyes. He was high already. Grab a seat, Reina, he said. That's what my father called me when I was a little kid. Queen. Hadn't heard that in a while. How much longer till they let us in? I asked. About half, another half an hour. This way we'll be in the very front. A lot of work just to see dinosaurs. Hey, it's rhinoceros. Some things are worth lining up for. Rhinoceros have been playing the Aragon for decades now, and Jose Maria had never missed any of their Chicago stops. At least since our parents had allowed him to attend concerts. And that wasn't very long ago. It was barely a year. He was allowed to go if I went with him, and that meant I had to go see a lot of shows. How much do I owe you? I said. Just give me 30, I said. Handed him three tens. I had 90 minutes, if, maybe a little more, if we could chat a little inside. Oh, if we could chat a little inside the Aragon. Thought it. I thought it would take me an eternity to be able to. Oh, excuse me. I thought it would take me an eternity to be able to talk to you without mom and dad poking in, I said. It's no problem if you want. I can text dad to turn right around. Just drop me off 30 minutes ago. You can come hang with us all night. You can come hang with us all night. Well, somebody else said, giggling, threatening to text on his phone. Oh, God, no. Please don't call Dad over here. I'll die. Of course. Okay, in all seriousness, let me show you something, okay? I pulled out my phone and brought up all the saved searches I had found online. But also, the academic materials I had gathered at the university library since I had been released from the hospital. Oh my goodness. I had to readjust myself on my chair. <laughs> I'll see here. Um, since I have been released from the hospital, I found a lot of information, but I organized it as best as I could in a folder because I wasn't really sure if any of it was useful for what I needed. I handed my brother the phone and he scanned for almost 20 minutes until he handed the phone back to me. He lit up a cigarette and offered me one. I passed. So I said, so what? You know how to Google? Congratulations to you, Stephen Hawking. Jose Maria flourished his right hand and <laughs> took a small bow in my direction. His sleek eyebrows and his hoodie, his thin stubble, it reminded me of a medieval court jester. He would never, ever stop making fun of me as long as we lived. With a sigh, I turned the phone screen back to his direction. Did mom and dad talk to you about their visit to my hospital room? Not really. Mom, he said, mom stayed up crying every night. And during the whole time you were in the hospital, dad went up to the attic and reorganized the whole thing. He put every book and the, and the tchotchke we had up there into little plastic crates. And he labeled every single one of them. He did this over and over, a real shitload. He did, a, he did a good job, just like a psycho should, but no. He didn't say anything either. Jose Maria, I am still having nightmares about Millennium Riot. The reporters won't stop calling me, and they show up on canvas looking for those of us who were there, and my face. What about it? Jose Maria had never been prone to coddle me when came to my looks. He awaited my answer. I don't look the same. Probably never will. Feels ugly. He nodded. 
Yeah, just like a little chip brother would. <laughs> what does your face have to do with any of this? My brother said. Well, you're not going to believe me until I show you. So I'll take a look here at this image I pulled up at the World Digital Library. Ah, you went up and dug up Florentine Codex? Nice. Well, somebody has sat straight up, letting the wall support him. He pulled up his hoodie. He pulled his hoodie back up and spikes of his hair rose into standing while the longer locks fell back he grabbed the phone from me the florentine codex is cool as shit it talks about miklan that's why i wanted to talk to you while it's just the two of us oh i thought you came to see rhinoceros with me because you recognize a person with great test you bitch Relax, I'm here to see the show too, but you're the only person who obsesses this much about, well, this stuff. This stuff. Legends of gods, statues bathed in sacrificial blood. Deities whose internal organs fell out of their stomachs, like Hannibal Lecter trophies. These were stories of old rituals, superstitious crap. Three weeks ago, in my hospital bed, my parents had warned me about a place called Miklan. Up until then, they had never mentioned a word, this, the word much, except in nightmare tale, nighttime tales. Or in some books in their library in our, very, in our small living room. But that wasn't enough information. I had started my searches in the university library. I learned Miklan was the realm of the dead in the times of the Aztecs, a place ruled by two lords, the god and goddess of death, blood and sacrificial tribute. Miklan was the place where souls were said to travel when they left this world. In the end, I found out almost too much information. It was more I knew. It was more I knew what to do with. There was so much of it, archaeological evidence, scholarly work, BuzzFeed trash, that by the time I, that by the time I finished my research, I felt like I had not accomplished much at all. And as I stayed up at nine in the library reading abstracts, I realized I should have consulted Jose Maria in the first place. Miklan is the shit. He said, it's supposed to have mountains made of poisonous spikes and rivers swimming with monsters. Hades has nothing on this place. It's about as secret as you can get. After all, you have to kick the can if you want to see it. He laughed. And his laughter infected me with giggles, even though I was it, the sober one. Each time we looked at each other, We snorted again. When we were done, Jose Maria put his finger on the screen. That guy right there is the king. Miklan Tecutli. Tecutli. Yeah, Miklan Tecutli. He's got this sick blade coming right out of his skull face. He's got a wife too. And together they govern this place. So fucking dope. The figure of the god whose name meant the Lord of Miklan showed up, showed a reclining figure with a human skull instead of a face made of flesh. His headdress rose into the sky with a bird with bird feathers, and a bloody obsidian blade shooted from the nostrils of his skull face. It really meant nothing to me. Jose Maria had moved towards all things Aztec, Olmec, Teotihuacan, Huacan, and Maya since he was a kid. But I had more been more interested in history, civics classes, and math. The things grounded in tangible reality. I preferred the real world. Tiananmen Square, the crimes of Pol Pot, the civil riots. Those were concepts I could operate on and 
all through the years, Jose Maria lived in his little bubble of mythology books, vampire mo novels, and comics. But that's what made my little brother my little brother. The purveyor of all that was weird. The image we were both staring at was a page from the Florentine Codex, created in the 16th century, and its creator, Friar Bernardino de Sahagún. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll take a sip of my tea. Had chronicled the beliefs and habits of the Aztecs during their early conquest. In this particular image, a half dozen men surrounded a woman in a grassy field, while a warrior in a headdress brandished a club. In the background, green mountains filled the horizon. Floating shapes like ghosts made of stone floated in the air. So I can't stop thinking about this image, and here's why. That day at the hospital, mom and dad said that there was something wrong with me. That I had been contaminated by something that had happened to me when I was 13. This passage describes a grassy field drenched in death, and for some reason it reminds me of the Millennium Riot. Mom and dad said that I had brought something full of death back with me. A creature. Jose Maria whistled. He stretched his legs and... The grin, the grin on his face lit up from ear to ear. Wow, Dad's dealer must have gotten him some really good shit. You know, Dad doesn't smoke. I'm serious. This, they really said this, and this is why I was texting you so much the past over over the past couple weeks. I wanted to talk to you to see if they mentioned any of this before. All they talked about is your reconstructive surgery and Uncle Theo's divorce. Oh, and Maddie's ugly baby. Well, that and the mayor's crackdown on the OLF after the riots. There's that too. But they don't mention you that much. Not that way. Every time I look at this picture with that warrior and his club, my heart began, begins to race so fast. I think I'm going to die if I stare at it too long. I feel the panic of what happened in Millennial Park. Why, Jose Maria? Those who make the trip to the city of Miklan don't come back, my brother said. That's just the way it works. Maybe you're worried about death after what happened? Maybe this isn't so literal. Maybe our parents just want you to get more in touch with our roots. Roots feel so far away. My Spanish is barely remedial. I don't even know how to pronounce some of the names of the places and things in this research. Touching roots is a sad understatement. That's just it, I said. Mom and Dad said I have to go on a trip to Miklan to reach adulthood. Jose Maria, have you ever heard the phrase when you step inside the Palace of Skulls? Jose Maria considered my, my words, and he glanced at me sideways, as if I were the one who was high on weed. No, I'm not going to answer that quite yet, mostly because I think I have heard the phrase, but I can't remember exactly where. But I can help you dig in info in the, on the place. I'll look it up when I get home tonight. Of course... Some of the stories conflict and some details are lost with the people who died in the colonization of the New World. And one more thing, shouldn't you be consulting with some archaeologist professor at school? I'm only 15, remember? This stuff is so weird that I'm embarrassed to bring it up to anyone. All I have done is pull up on my, on, pull up on my own searches. And you are the one that's always reading this on this. You have to help me. My brother and I had been sitting on the cold pavement for so long. We were going numb. We faced a gray wall that was past the elevated train tra tracks of the train. And several people had been walking up and down the line, chatting with friends, finding the end of the line, or simply killing their boredom with a cigarette. Scalpers orbited the block too asking who needed tickets for the show. 
I was so focused on what my brother was saying that I never noticed a pair of workman boots stop right next to where we sat. After all this time, you fuckers still insist on this socialist shit? No. After all this time, you fuckers insist on this socialist shit still? The owner of the boots was a short man, packed with muscle, his face taut with tension. He wore a rhinoceros baseball cap and a flannel shirt. I knew immediately he was referring to me. I wore an OLF armband on my left shoulder. It was a logo less it was a logoless design, just white letters on a black background, but unmistakable. The armband usually sparked up a lot of conversations around campus, but it didn't occur to me that it would anger someone like this outside the Aragon. Hey, we didn't come here to get yelled at, Jose Maria said. We're just hanging out. All our taxpayer money gets sunk into doubling up on cops and riot gear, thanks to the piece of shit like the OLF man. It all starts with the stupid fucks that join in on this shit. Do you really think the OLF, OLF is looking out for you? I had to say something. I remained seated, though I felt awkward. But I was scared to stand of standing up. What if he started a shoving match or worse? I remember the pain I had felt for days inside my bones from being beaten physically. The man in the work boots looked ready to lunge. His thick neck puffed like a cobra. Have you looked around the city recently? I said. The city is close to being ins ins insolvent. And we've got one of the worst murder rates in the country. And our school system's going down the hole and fast. You have faith in the traditional way of doing things then? This is the same shit I get from all of you fucking hipsters every time I bring the subject up. We wouldn't have all this shit if you, if you all, uh, if you all, you losers, just got jobs and kept illegals from stealing jobs. Jose Maria stood up. I dreaded this moment already. You want to watch what you say? He said. The man in the workbooks crossed his arms and laughed at Jose Maria's face. He texted on his phone for a second and laughed at us again. Uh, I'm, I'm going to refrain from using the B word. Um, so I'm just going to say uh, fucking beep. I'm sending you my damn tax bill. Uh, I'm sending you my damn tax bill next time it arrives. I hate that word so much. The man peeled away toward the end of the line, laughing at us as he walked away. My heart was racing and the scars inside my cheeks hurt. My back pulsed with electricity. So angry, and yet I never know the right things to say, I said. Forget it, Jose Maria said. Came here for the show. Look, they are, op they are opening the doors. Tell me the rest of what we were talking about inside. As the long line, as the line of concert goers went through the glass doors of the Aragon, I looked over my shoulder, see if I could spot the man in the work boots. He was nowhere to be seen. I felt as if he was somewhere near watching us. I handed my ticket over to the door. My hand shook uncontrollably like the hand of an old person. Relax, Clara, Jose Maria said off to my left as security searched him. You look like you're, you've seen a ghost. When we get upstairs, I'll tell you how to get to Miklan. Suddenly, the cavernous entrance of the Aragon, with its Spanish motifs, felt like a suffocating tomb. I put my hand on the Olaf band on my jacket and considered taking it off, but I knew Jose Maria wouldn't let me. I walked through the turnstile. As I walked through the turnstile. As we joined the hundreds of people in line in the concert hall, I got the distinct sensation that whatever I felt was watching me 
was not the man in the brown work boots. I was being watched by some thing or someone feral and dark. I felt an ache come over my joints and face, and it took me several seconds to get my heart rate down through heavy breathing. If I could have if I could have bought a beer, I would have. Jose Maria waited for me at the bottom of the double staircase, and we ascended into the dark together. So I'm going to go ahead and bookmark here. So we will pick up from here <laughs> on the next story time. Uh, I will schedule a another story time so we can uh, pick up. But I'm going to say thank you all so much for joining. Uh, yeah, I know. A cliffhanger. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, it, We got 15 minutes. We're going to go. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is we're going to discuss. We're going to take this time to kind of like relax and discuss what we just been through. So um, what does everybody think? What's in everybody's thoughts? I have a, I have a feeling that she, that what she, my guess, it has something to do with the snake design on the cover. That's my guess that this is that, that this is a snake. Yeah, it's She-Ra, yeah. But, like, She-Ra, like, in the, you know, like, the He-Man She-Ra. S-H-E hyphen Ra. I also have to be very careful with slurs, re reading um, moments that have slurs in them. Um, uh, because, you know, even though it's it's in the book, I gotta be very careful because stream, you know, we could get in trouble for it. Um, also, I really hate that word. <laughs> I really hate that word. Um, I do like, I will say this, I do like the relationship with her brother. And um, because it reminds me of my, it reminds me of it reminds me of my relationship with my brother. Uh, we have that kind of back and forth and stuff. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. No spoilers. No spoilers. Um, but we, because we've gotten Cesar Torres' official blessing, we will have another story time. I will do more story times. What this means, though. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But it makes sense in the context of showing the level of racism that this man had. So it, it like there's context to it. But unfortunately Twitch would not would not Twitch is not gonna well personally, you know, I avoid like I don't like that word. Um because it has been thrown at me before. Um a lot of things have been thrown at me growing up. Um but I will say this it's uh, it, it's Clara's relationship to her brother and Clara's relationship to her parents, I feel personal because it's even though it's like like not the same type of traditions and stuff like that, but it's it's just that like I can form that connection because I feel that. I totally feel that. Um goodness, I need more tea. No more tea right there. Get some water here. Um, again. Oh no, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm gonna say is that if you want to read along, if you want to read along, I highly recommend getting 13 Secret Cities from LED.com. Oh, sorry, LEDQueens.com. Goodness, I can't. I gotta say that URL correctly. LEDQueens.com. If you want to get an autographed copy from Cesar Torres or if you don't mind if you don't want the autograph copy then go to Amazon you can purchase a copy at Amazon 
Me personally, I like going to I like to go to ledqueens.com because there's I, I just like his website. I just rather get it from his site than Amazon. But I am reading from my Kindle. I also have the Kindle version, so um so that's how I'm reading it to you guys today. Um But no, I mean, uh, did you guys enjoy this story time? Did you all have a good time? Because I had a good time reading this to you guys. I had a really good time. Um, you know, hopefully we might be able to get some more people uh, next time so we can have a bigger story time. Um, I might, what I might do, what I might do is I might have story time on a different day um that way we can still do final fantasy shadowbringers on saturday or we can do this we can do this once a month I, i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna need to think about it so um yeah because i also this is a lot of this is a lot of speaking and a lot of character acting and um and so, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I gotta also protect my voice. And so, uh, cause I could feel myself getting tired cause I was talking a lot today. Um, but what we're going to do is I think what we'll do is that once a month, I think what we'll do is that at the once a month, at the end of the month, we will do story time. And so this will be a monthly thing. It'll be the, um, I will let you all know in a tweet. I will tweet it out to let everybody know what I decide. But I think what we might do, what we might do is have uh, a story time at the end of the month, every month. And that way we can get through the book, have a little break and just kind of like, it'll be like in, be in between gaming content. Um, if you all like that idea, we will do that. Uh, I could also do story time. Uh, figure out. And I, I mean, if that doesn't work for you guys, and then we might do something else. Again, I have to think about it, but that's the direction that I'm heading. We most likely will be doing it once a month at the end of the month, the last Saturday of the month. And so just keep an eye out on my schedule. Uh, so since we're approaching the end of the stream, I once again... Highly recommend getting yourself a copy of 13 Secret Cities by Cesar Torres. If you enjoyed what you heard here, please give us a follow. If you are watching the, the replay of this, hi. Um, just to let you know that all of our videos uh, go onto our YouTube channel so that um, you can keep track of all of this. And um, so basically, so for today, um, this stream will be on the YouTube channel. We're going to create a very special um, playlist for it. Uh, so that way you all can can follow along. It will be, it'll have, it'll be under Storytime with Darkborn. But it will also, the book itself will have its own, uh, each of the books will have its own um playlist as well so um but yeah so uh you know what yeah you know what i'm gonna make the decision let's make the decision now i am deciding that the the last saturday of every month is gonna be story time with darkborn we're making it officially a part of the stream and we're gonna keep reading 13 secret cities i am excited to get further in there's so much more to read there's just so much more. We're still in the intro. Like, we're still in the beginning of it. Like, we still haven't even... Like, again, my theory is that what followed her back, that her... That her, like, spirit animal is the snake. Or, like, her mother said that somehow she wandered into Miklan got freaked out and the snake followed her back. So. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and also again, uh, 
we have a YouTube, we have a Twitter, we have an, we don't have an Instagram. We have a TikTok. So uh, we might actually um, take a clip from here and put it on TikTok so you guys can, uh, so that they can have a little taste of 13 Secret Cities. Um, but once again, thank you all so much for watching my protagonist and I will catch you next time on um, Monday at 6 45 PM. We will be having another Senses and Dumbasses Flights of the Legacy episode 21 of season two. All right. And I will catch you all next time. Everyone also thank LED Queens, AKA Cesar Torres so much for being a part of the stream and doing Q and a with us. And, uh, we look forward to, to, to seeing him if, if, if he's free to join us for the next, for the next part of it. Uh, if not cool, <laughs> but LD, you are always welcome to be here. Uh, you know, uh, whenever we do story time of your books, feel free to, you know, to hang out and do Q and a, if you want, we're more than welcome. And with all that said, everyone, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you on our next date, protagonists.